I've just been sitting here playing with uh, the new Apple Watch Studio. The new what? The Studio? Yeah, What's the Apple that? Watch. It's the the new way you shop for Apple Watches where you can mix and match cases and bands and order whatever you want. I didn't realize there was a new Studio. So is it just on um, the Watch tab on the Apple website? Uh, yeah, you can do it from there or from the Apple Store app. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's kind of cool. I ordered, uh, so I went back to just plain stainless steel for the series five. Uh, I branched out and tried, tried gold, the gold stainless steel with series four and I like how it looks, but I've been frustrated over the last year that I couldn't wear a majority of the bands I had gotten in the years prior because mm. they're all for stainless steel specifically. Yeah. Um, so I kind of felt trapped, which is, which is too bad because titanium looked really interesting to me. But I didn't want to have to wear only a handful of my bands again. So, but I mean, they all they all click together, right? <laughs> it's just your, yeah, it's just a, what like a, a look thing that you're going for. Yeah, I just or, like, or do you really want the the like the is it the clasp that doesn't match properly? Yeah, those ones especially are the ones that bother me. Yeah, um, the ones that have like the plastic or just colored or even leather. Uh, lugs that snap into the watch are fine pretty much with anything but the ones i have that are specifically stainless steel uh like my link bracelet my my uh classic buckle and things like that i don't think look very good if the materials don't match yeah you really want those metals to match don't you yeah which i'm pretty uh that's, i think that's part of the reason i bought a leather loop because it would just go with anything but then after not very long the leather just started to break apart anyway <laughs> oh really yeah (laughs) mine's holding up okay but i don't wear it very often so yeah i think that's the key yeah it's not an everyday wear an edc everyday carry (laughs) (laughs) i've definitely started defaulting to uh just the new uh, sport loops i like them a lot are they like the kind of velcro-y type ones yeah they are Mm, yeah they do look good they're very comfortable they look way more comfortable than the original sports loop which were made out of that poly plastic type thing. Floralastomer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, from Series Zero, I was wearing the Floralastomer for mm-hmm. a little while and I started getting wrist pains, actually. Um, I couldn't wear it any looser because it was already like ridiculously loose and I was still getting these wrist pains. And I was, I was worried that it was actually the Apple Watch like pressing down on my wrist bones or something in my arm that was causing it and that I wouldn't be able to wear an Apple watch. But as soon as I switched out of the sports loop to, I think I got a nylon band maybe at that point, uh, mm-hmm. all those pains went away. So I just can't wear the original sports loops. Was it just fitting you poorly or like allergic I don't know. Reaction? I mean, no, no. Although that's another story. Um, I, yeah, I, it wasn't how tight I was wearing it. Cause I went like ridiculously loose and I was still getting these wrist pains. Huh. Maybe it was just the way that the watch rested on my wrist when it was like when it was just when my arm was sitting on a flat surface. I'm not sure. I actually mostly noticed it in the car, so maybe it was some angle that I held my my wrist out when I was driving. Huh. Yeah. Uh the allergic reaction thing, I bought some uh fake um Hermes bands off eBay and <laughs> put them on my wrist and they they left a red ring on my wrist where they burnt me whatever really? factory out of china they came from they um i don't know they weren't washed or i don't know whatever machine they came out of maybe <laughs> um yeah left something a little toxic on the surface Ugh. well speaking of Hermes, i'm kind of disappointed and this isn't a new issue uh but apple discontinued their classic buckles maybe last year and, mm-hmm. and that's really my favorite it just looks like a traditional watch band uh and now if you want something like that you have to pay like 500 dollars for an hermes one since apple doesn't make them anymore oh so that's your only choice now if you want if you want like an official one yeah i guess i could go to amazon and get a knockoff or something ah yeah who wants to do that yeah you might end up with a burnt wrist (laughs) so i still have the the same classic buckle i got with my series two and it's I mean, it's starting to show some wear, but 
a lot of people think that just adds character. So I'm okay with that for now. It's not falling mm-hmm. apart or anything yet. Yeah. Yeah. As long as it doesn't look like it, like tatty, then, you know, a bit right. of wear usually looks pretty good. Yeah. So I'm, I'm okay with it for now. Good morning. Good morning. Speaking of Apple Watches, uh, listeners may remember that I I had an issue with my Apple Watch, whereas it uh, got the crack around like the circumference of the screen. And mm. of course, Apple, um, I say they refused to repair it. In, that's my Those are my words, uh, because they didn't have a repair program. They, they would only replace the whole thing, which cost like a ridiculous amount of money. Like I could have just bought another watch practically for for not much more right so that's what i say that's what i mean when i say they refuse to repair it but anyway they announced a replacement program for basically exactly the that problem the the crack around the circumference of the screen uh and one other cracking pattern which uh i'm just loading up the page to see what it is uh a crack which kind of goes from three o'clock to six o'clock kind of around the edge of the display as well yeah uh covers quite a few models series two and series three um pretty much all the variations mm-hmm. and um yeah it's kind of annoying because of course i just i sold that watch as like an as is to someone for a, for a pittance oh um, man so yeah i i came out second best on that whole process despite my um numerous attempts to get apple to fix it and <laughs> there was all sorts of evidence online at the time that uh, that this was like a fault with the watch uh, some people were saying it was the the battery swelling although mine didn't show any symptoms of that mm-hmm. um so it seems to be just a design flaw with the watches uh, and unfortunately i think a lot of people have already either um paid for the replacement the entire replacement it's like 80 percent of the the new cost it was it was really high Mm -hmm. or just uh i don't know sold their their cracked watch or chucked it out um worst case it does seem to specifically be an issue with the aluminum watches uh because they're not covering any of the stainless steel ones ah right okay so maybe some maybe the case isn't quite hard enough to to i don't know Maybe it flexes or something like that, or it, yeah. uh, I don't know, changes with temperature. Apple's had a few problems with like temperature changing things in recent history. Oh, yeah. Was it the iPhone 10? If, if it got really cold, the touchscreen wouldn't work for a little bit. Yeah. Some, and I think some iPads, if they got really hot, the touch wouldn't work. Right. Yeah. yeah you know, noticed- I didn't actually notice that it was only the aluminium models that were affected, but uh, yeah, mine, mine was. Uh, falls under that category. I've got a, a completely smashed Series 2 where I hit the watch against a doorknob. Do you think they'll replace that? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Worth a <it> shot. <laughs> you want to send that to me and I'll try it? <laughs> it's uh, rose gold if you're okay with wearing that. Oh, yeah. Looks sounds okay. good to me. <laughs> no, is the screen completely shattered or does it match that pattern? Oh, no. Like it's, the ring it's around the screen. completely destroyed. Oh, okay. It's falling out and... In- like little glass left and mm-hmm. anyway that was my frustration for the week <laughs> i'm not sure there's much else to say about it <laughs> yeah are you are you tempted by not to get too far ahead are you tempted by the new apple watches at all let's save it let's save it for the show okay <laughs> <laughs> there are a few things that, that apple would have to do to really tempt me back to the apple watch but yeah okay. i'll save that <laughs> uh, so apple customers Served on the street after a gang smashes the front window of my... The front windows, plural, of my two local Apple stores. So, the only ones really around me and the only ones for like a four-day drive. Um, Apple Perth City and Apple Garden City. Um, it looked like a pretty well-organized attack because they hit the the Perth City store first. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember how many there were, but it was like a small gang of people. Smashed right through the front glass. Um, the video shows them coming into the store and then a taxi driving past out the front and they quickly scampered. So that um, that theft, that burglary was thwarted. But 30 minutes later, they um, accosted a security guard at, at the other one. The first one, the Perth City one, is kind of just on the street. 
the next one's actually in a shopping mall. Uh, mm-hmm. So they um, they got past the security and then broke in and took away with uh, three hundred thousand dollars in like retail value of of various Apple devices. Yeah, this is crazy to me because of of all electronic devices you could steal, uh, Apple devices at least seem to me to have the least value after being stolen because they can be completely remotely disabled from ever being used again. Uh, so unless you're selling them for specific parts, which is quite a bit of, of extra work, it doesn't seem like the return on <laughs> accosting a security guard and smashing a window is really worth it. Right. And that was like the headline story of local news, of course. Although I think this news went pretty global as well. Um, mm-hmm. At least the local news was saying that for the most part, these devices are worthless. Um, there was one news outlet that interviewed a tech expert um, who was saying that uh, the devices might have part value on the secondhand market. But besides that, that's <laughs> there's not much to them. So, yeah, you're right. I think they probably would have done better off just, I don't know, robbing a jewelry store or something else. Something yeah. else that's small and valuable and doesn't have like remote activation locks. <laughs> they better just taking like the Apple Watch bands off the wall and leaving with those. Probably be more valuable yeah. in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or all the drones if they had many out on the shelf. Oh, yeah, sure. Anything that doesn't have an Apple logo on it, they're probably better off stealing from the Apple store. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So why hit an Apple store? <laughs> exactly. Just because yeah. they leave everything setting out, I guess. Yeah. It's, it's too tempting, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know how things uh, are set up over there, but here, if you go into something like a Walmart, uh, anything that's worth more than like $100 is behind a locked case or strapped to the shelves, and you have to get someone to help you take them off. So the Apple Store is kind of special in that way. Uh, it may be easier to, to steal from. Yeah, I think pretty typical is to have those little wires that, I don't know, somehow are attached to the demo devices and they're, they're armed with some sort of security trip. Right. Hmm. Hmm. So, yeah. So, Apple customers were served on the street since uh, both shops were closed for for a little while after that. Has there been any updates on that? Like, have they caught the, caught the people who did it? I haven't seen any updates, but I also haven't really looked for any updates. Sure. Hmm. I imagine I'd see it on the news if, it was, if there was something. You wouldn't think they'd be that hard to find. Uh, with Apple being able to, well, actually, if if the devices were running iOS 13, then they'd be very easy to find because if they turn them off, they can still be found. Even if they turn them off, right? That's the new low power beacon that the phones emit, and I I believe when at WWDC they said even the phone is turned off or or doesn't have internet reception, it can still uh, send out this low power beacon. Uh, are you talking about the new iPhones? Because you said iOS 13. Right, yeah. I believe this is just an iOS 13 feature. I don't think it's specific to the new iPhones. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So uh, even like an iPhone 10s is going to have it? Right. Hmm. Nice. Not sure how I missed that one. It got very... I don't know if lukewarm reception is the right word at WWDC. Uh, there's definitely mixed mixed reactions when when... Maybe Craig or whoever was on stage said there'd be a new way to track phones where they'd be able to do it even without signal and potentially being turned off. Hmm. I may be misremembering, but I believe that was the case. Yeah, there are definitely some concerns of like not being able to turn off a locating thing. Right. And the idea that your phone is connecting to other people's phones to to uh, update its location. Yeah. I do have a lot of faith in Apple in implementing that properly compared to other companies. Right. But Yeah, uh, if anyone's going to do it, I think Apple can do it right. Yeah. Uh, last on our pre, pre-show pre show topics. <laughs> I don't know what you call these, but Apple Music launches on the web. Yeah, this came out of nowhere. Yeah, it did. And I think it's to serve maybe people at work, basically, who work on a, a Windows computer or maybe even a Mac that's not theirs and... I don't know, can't use their phone as their music player while they're at their desk. Right. Or just prefer to use a desktop. I don't know. Uh, did I, you have a play around with it? Uh, I clicked into it once when this, when this article was posted last week. 
Uh, but I didn't even get as far as like signing in. <laughs> I, I saw that you didn't it, get very far at all then did you <laughs> i saw it didn't have podcasts i'm like well that's not gonna help me and then i closed it all right so. i think you can play podcasts on the web i mean you don't get like your subscriptions and whatnot but oh um, just just from like the apple website right i suppose that's possible just not how i'd prefer to view my podcasts <laughs> no <laughs> so no. hardly ideal i don't think you'd even get like um uh, playback location back to your other devices when you went to them. Right. Yeah, I'm sure it, it's not connected to your account in any way. I was kind of looking towards this as a way to rem- move away from using iTunes on my work computer. Uh, but until I can do podcasts or they have a better way of doing podcasts on the web, uh, I'm going to be stuck using iTunes for a little while longer. Maybe you could switch to Overcast or something which has a web player and um, and then just use yeah, Apple Music on the web. Yeah. Maybe I should give third-party podcast players a try. I've never, just, I've just never found a need to do that. Mm. I was all on, all about the yeah, the first-party podcast app until iOS twelve, and then I mean, to my, just my opinion, it just it became terrible, and so huh. it forced me to switch to Overcast, and <laughs> I haven't looked back. Okay, I'll have to check them out. Yeah, worth doing. So, uh, but anyway, I did try Apple Music on the web, mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah. Oh, man, I'm forgetting something. Happy birthday. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Because <laughs> it's like, it's the day after for me now, but it still is your birthday, isn't it? Uh, yeah, my time it still is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man, I can't believe that slipped my mind. Should have opened with that. I'm going to edit this to the start of the show. <laughs> you sent me happy birthday your time, so I think I think you're on top of it. All yeah. Right. Okay, cool. <laughs> but I, I I thought it needed to be said on the show for sure. Thanks. So, what are you doing for your birthday? I'm recording this podcast. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I let's see. No, there's nothing special I'm doing. Went to work, came home, record the podcast. Okay. Is it a birthday? Is like a big or a small thing for you typically? Uh, they're not very big for me. I don't usually make a big deal of them. As a matter of fact, no one at my office even knew it was my birthday today, so. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds like you're playing it low key then. <laughs> I guess. It's just not even big <laughs> enough for me to mention. Like it's not a, um, like a milestone birthday, do you mean? Uh, I don't know. I guess 25 could be a milestone. Yeah. Yeah. Quarter of a century. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I'd call it a milestone birthday here. It's more like 21 and then 30. Right. Yeah. Well, 20, 25 is the last birthday in the United States that you like gain the last little bit of your rights. Like you can't rent a oh, car what do you until gain? you're 25. You can't rent a car. <laughs> what, you just just blanket, you cannot rent a car. That's uh, crazy. I don't, I don't think it's like a law or anything, but it seems like a lot of car rental companies have like a 25 age limit. Mm, okay so i think we have just like a you pay like 10x the regular rental amount when you're below 25 something like that. right (laughs) yeah that might be the case as well so yeah it's also kind of a uh a weird day to celebrate for any reason Mm, recording on september 11 right so uh yeah it's just mixed emotions on a day like this, and it seems weird to make it about me. Mm. All right. On a on a higher note, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I guess uh, I think this Apple Music on the web is is an indicator that Apple is done with the days of of developing iTunes for Windows, and they're going to be expecting everyone to use the web player from now on. Ah, right. So this is probably less about like helping people on Windows computers at work and more about just taking a load of work off them in developing iTunes for Windows. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. So. Um, oh, yeah, I, I, w- I did use it. I logged in. I played music for a little while. Um, it stopped just randomly at one point, but besides that, I didn't have any other problems. It's got, got my library there. It's got all the regular playlists. It's got all my playlists as well. 
it's um yeah it's apple music <laughs> it's, it's apple music <laughs> yeah if you're all in on that it's perfect yeah i'm not sure if uh smart playlist would be there that's probably a thing that the, like a a power listener would first look to that's not something i've ever messed with so i wouldn't even know mm, okay so yeah that's there all right you want to kick into the interesting stuff <laughs> the kind of interesting kind of boring stuff all right i, I literally fell asleep during the iphone um 11 pro part of the uh, topic and i didn't wake up until the morning really <laughs> <laughs> i don't know yeah i was i was almost sure that uh that you didn't even bother getting up for the keynote because i didn't message you back when you're messaging me right yeah i was like sending you like my opinions as it was going on and you didn't even read the messages so like oh james must be asleep yeah there are a few reasons for that um oh, yeah. firstly my my um ipad was on do not disturb so i didn't even notice actually that i was getting messages right. um and secondly i wasn't actually looking at the video i was just listening to it and lying in bed <laughs> because okay. i uh i set an alarm for one o'clock um i chose an alarm which was like something from my music library which was fairly uh quiet like acoustic because I, uh my my two-year-old is in the same room as me uh, okay. uh but i don't know the song wasn't downloaded or something and it just played the default alarm which just woke up everyone of course uh at five to one in the morning so that's great and then i had a, a real trouble getting him back to sleep and um i didn't want to wake up my wife again because she had work in the morning anyway long story short i i, I wanted to stay in the room but i couldn't have any screens on so i ended up just listening to the <laughs> the keynote okay uh without watching it which is a, a new and interesting experience i can see how um, you fall asleep during that <laughs> yeah I mean, I did pretty well. I stayed awake like an hour and 15 or whatever it was to get until the uh, 11 Pro. Uh, right. But I don't remember anything after that. Ah, uh, okay. So that's why you missed yeah. the Apple Watch Studio bit. Oh, was that at the end? Yeah. Wait. No, the Apple Watch was before the iPhones, though. So after the iPhone announcements, when, okay, first of all, when, when Tim started the show, he says, we got a jam-packed show. And I'm going to skip all my regular updates and we're going to get right into it. And then he, he, he wrapped up iPhones like 40 minutes before the two hour mark. It's like, oh man, they got something too big to announce. Uh, and they had their new, I wish I remember her name, their new uh, director of uh, sales, that new person in charge of Apple uh, stores. Deidre O'Brien. Yes. Thank you. Uh, she came out and announced a couple of new changes. One of them being the Apple Watch Studio. Right. Yeah. No, I, I did see that, but that's like an in-store thing, right? It's also online. It's both. Okay. Okay. I'm just getting confused between in-store and online because I, I, <laughs> I did watch the rest of it uh, okay. later, <laughs> later on, <laughs> and I saw the whole yeah in-store Apple Watch Studio thing, which looks pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah that'd be cool. Um. There was only um, one surprise that I really had after listening and not seeing and then jumping online in the morning and, and seeing everything for the first time. Okay. Uh, at, w at one point, Phil, or well, actually, this is how I think he opened for the iPhone um, 11 Pro. Mm -hmm. uh, all new design. That, that Those are his words. <laughs> uh-huh. That was his words. <laughs> yeah. So you imagine my surprise when I looked at photos in the morning and uh, it was the exact same design plus a few <laughs> minor tweaks. It's, so it's a lot like how the iPhone 7 was an all new design. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of people took issue with that on the subreddit. Yeah. And I can see why. Yeah. Uh, Phil definitely has a, a history of, of maybe... Um, exaggerating his statements on stage and then eating his words later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, do you want to go through this in so order? So, that was my experience. Sorry? So, do you want to go through this in, in the order everything was announced? Yeah, sure. Is there anything to note about your experience of watching it? Did you watch it with your eyes closed or um, standing on your head? Uh, no. I had a very, very traditional Apple keynote experience of sitting on my couch and watching it on the TV. 
uh, religious holiday, to observing the religious <laughs> holiday. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, we'll sure then we'll kick off with Apple Arcade. Yeah. Uh, I think that the $5 a month starting price that we're going to see when it launches next week is is on the nose. I, w- I wouldn't want to pay any more than that for a subscription game service. Especially with the the quality of the games that they had demoed on stage, I was not impressed. Oh, really? Okay. Were you? Did you did you like the games they had? Uh, admittedly, I didn't go back and rewatch that part, so ah, I okay. didn't. Um, yeah, I, the, I heard about them. <laughs> they just looked very much like mobile games, and I was hoping for for something maybe a little more console quality experience. Um. Just something a little simpler than a remake of Frogger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is called Apple Arcade, so what do you expect, really? That's right. No, yeah, of I'm course kidding. it's going to be Frogger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think there's some some things down the line. Uh, I never played the original Ocean Horn, but I heard it was extremely good. Uh, mm, so a lot I'm, of people uh, rave about that. Right. I'm excited to try Ocean Horn 2. Uh, I think that'll be closer to the console quality experience a lot of people say it's a really good game for people who enjoy zeldas which i do so Mm -hmm. i'm excited to try that out because zelda's never coming to ios that's for sure oh yeah well i mean nintendo's made a couple mario and uh mario kart and pokemon and animal crossing games i could see them making a really simple mobile game with like a Zelda skin on it which seems to be the direction they've gone so mm. far. Yeah, okay. So nothing to the scale of like Breath of the Wild because those are right. are sellers of their consoles. That, right. Yeah. Yeah, that would be shooting themselves in the foot to put any like full scale Mario or Zelda game on mobile. Right. It does seem like a very attractive price, doesn't it? I think a lot of people are already spending this amount of money just on either in-app purchases or games that require like a pro subscription or something like that. Yeah, um, I yeah. I probably wouldn't think twice about buying a couple of games at that price in a month if I found a couple of things that are really appealing, which it's, it's exactly. not, not likely I'd find two really good games in a month. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy paying that price, especially when it's a family plan and up to six people can can play these games for the $5 a month. Mm, yep. Unfortunately, I don't have anyone else in my family that plays games, so it's just, well, even I don't really play games. I'm certainly going to jump on the one month free trial, though, and if uh, if anything hooks me, then yeah. I'm, gonna be I'm excited up. about uh, putting it up on the Apple TV and, and handing the kids a controller and see if they can manage their way around it. What sort of controllers do you have for your Apple TV? Uh,. Well, I have PlayStation and Xbox controllers, and now that those work, I can I can give those to the kids. I also have, I think it's a Nimbus or whatever those uh, made for iOS controllers were before Apple opened up. So yeah, the Steel Series Nimbus. That's the one yeah. I've got. I yeah, so most I've, people I've have got one of those. Plenty of options. I might actually just pick up a second Nimbus because they're such cheap controllers, and <laughs> let the kids play with those instead of giving them the sixty dollars Xbox controller. Right. Okay. <laughs> I think that. I'm not sure if the Nimbus ever um, came out with uh, the joystick clicking, though. You know, whatever you call that. Right. Yeah, they don't have that uh, because until maybe even iOS 13, Apple didn't support it. As right. A, as a button. So uh, there should be heaps of uh, PlayStation and Xbox controllers just floating around the secondhand market. It might even be worth uh, having a look at that. Yeah. So we'll have to see if they even are interested in something like that. But for five dollars a month, it's worth trying. The next service uh, on the uh, on the lineup was Apple TV Plus, also yeah. for the same price. So it was a little, <laughs> yeah. Well, surprisingly, that they're charging for it, or that it's not some crazy amount. Uh, I was expecting, and I think the majority of the rumors leading up to the keynote was that Apple was going to be charging nine ninety nine a month. For Apple TV Plus, mm-hmm. which in my mind meant they're going to be dead in the water upon launch when you compare their services to something like Disney Plus, which 
is half the price and has, you know, Disney's entire catalog backing it. Uh, but with the $5 a month, I think they're competitive. Maybe nine ninety nine a month was the planned price until Disney's uh, price was announced. And then, um, yeah, the, the revised price just never made it. Or maybe they uh, they leaked that nine ninety nine just to happily <laughs> surprise everyone with four ninety nine. I would completely believe either of those. I honestly don't believe many people are even going to sign up at four ninety nine a month. Really, uh, they have been very vague about what the the, the catalogue of other TVs and show uh, movies and shows is going to be, but they did say there's there's going to be more than just the Apple original content. There will be a library behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yeah, and it is hard to say how compelling it is until we see exactly what that is. Um, but I think what's going to keep this boat floating is that every time someone buys a, a um, iPhone, iPad, or a Mac, you actually get a, a year of Apple TV+. Plus. So, of course, they're, they've done the clever thing by, like, end of year one, they're going to say we have, like, X million subscribers to our service, uh, and the service costs forty ninety nine a month, but, of course, like, I, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if 90% or more of those subscribers were just, you know, we just got it because they bought an Apple device. Right. No, I think this solves a big problem that I was concerned about leading into the launch of Apple TV Plus is... How can you charge even $5 a month when you only have a couple of original shows ready and your catalog is, is almost non-existent? Uh, and and the basically offering the first year free uh, definitely justifies their position and gives them time to build out their catalog more and also potentially get people hooked on some of their original content so they will be willing to renew when that one year runs out, assuming this promotion doesn't continue. Because uh, in my mind, this is maybe a six month thing and then they're not going to be giving out one year anymore. Mm. In my mind, it sounded like it would just be a forever thing. Oh, really? And I wonder if like after your first year's up you and you buy a new iPhone, do you get another year after that as well? So yeah, at that rate, or I is would it... never have to pay for Apple TV plus. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Maybe that's how they make it like Netflix big. Yeah. I mean, what's what's $50 over the course of a year uh to get someone to buy a new iPhone? Like I think they can definitely write that off if someone's buying a, a new Mac or iPhone instead. Oh yeah, for sure. So uh yeah, but that's very very compelling. I was really impressed by their prices. Uh I think they're definitely trying to be competitive in the market, which is good. The same way they were with Apple Music. Um I was disappointed there was no word about bundling services, though, which is still what I'd really like to do. Yeah, everyone's waiting for that magic word to pop up. Some sort of bundle. I mean, anything. Just give me iCloud and Apple Music together or something like that. Right, yeah. Uh, maybe we'll hear something at an October keynote closer to the launch of Apple TV+. Plus, uh, Because it just seems crazy they wouldn't have some kind of offer. Maybe they just want to keep it a la carte. Maybe that's the yeah, that's their selling point. I mean, the only reason I really want a bundle is because I can't justify ten dollars a month for news plus uh, but if it was thrown in on top of a bunch of other subscriptions that I am willing to pay for, like arcade and t v and iCloud and all of that, then i I would probably use news plus sometimes, but not enough to justify the ten dollars a month otherwise. It's a real standout, isn't it? Ten dollars a month compared to all these other services, which seemingly offer—I don't know—would you say they offer more than than News Plus? I think that, that's how it feels looking at it. Apple Arcade and Apple TV Plus. Uh, maybe it's just just because the idea of magazines and newspapers are so old-fashioned that it doesn't feel like they're worth anything. I do understand there's there's hundreds of of magazines and, and newspapers there. So there's definitely value behind it for people who care about that kind of stuff. But hmm. I don't think, I don't think Apple's target market cares enough to pay that much. Um, and I think that's definitely why they should be positioning it differently with a bundle or something else. I've heard very little about news plus really after the first few weeks after it was uh, launched. Yeah. No one said anything good, bad or indifferent about it since it launched. 
Yeah, it's a bad sign. I think everyone's just forgotten about it. I mean, even even the the publishers that had, I don't remember what they called them anymore, the live covers for their magazines, people are already dropping off of that and just uploading static PDFs of their magazines. So mm-hmm. wow. there's, there's clearly not a lot of uh, of motivation to support that. Next up is a new 10.2-inch iPad. So this is the iPad, which typically is just called iPad, and then might have a year after it to distinguish which iPad it is. iPad 2017, iPad 2018. Right. Well, the iPad 2019 uh, has grown a little bit, but uh, not much else. It's grown. It's, it's It has gained a smart connector, mm-hmm. um, and it's it's gone up a generation in chip. It's got an A10 chip. Um, so it's a few generations of chip behind. Um, it still doesn't have a laminated screen. So I mean, as someone who has like a, a non-laminated and a laminated screen iPad at home, the difference mm-hmm. is like night and day. The, right. uh, the non-laminated screen iPads really just do feel like a different class of device. They definitely feel like a cheaper device. Almost feel plasticky when you're using them, uh, even though it is glass, of course, still. Um, So is it a parts bin iPad when it's uh, like a 10.2 inch? Like, where are they getting this size display? Do you know? Right. Yeah, they had to invent a whole new uh, form factor for it. I I don't know if I'd call it a parts bin iPad. Um, But I think think even though there are some sacrifices – at the price point, uh, three hundred and thirty dollars, it's there's there's nothing on the market that comes close. No, there isn't. Yeah, so the, the price A10 is, is still a completely uh, workable chip, especially for uh, basic consumer stuff that most people would do for, with a low end iPad. Uh, the A10 is an amazing chip. Yeah, you could even do video editing and anything else on there. Um, yeah, probably four K as well. Yeah, it probably wouldn't. Uh, Export as fast as something like the A12, uh, but you're not missing out on too much. So I think for a lot of people, uh, this is going to be a great iPad for them. Why do you think it is that they increased the screen size? Because the previous screen size was like the screen size of iPads. Do you think they just realized that the market wants something bigger and, and they've just catered towards that? This is, yeah, this is really odd to me. Uh, this is our first time since 2010 that we have an iPad lineup with, with no 9.7-inch iPad. Yeah. Um, I mean, to say that someone wants something bigger, it's interesting to me, I texted you this, that they have a 10.2-inch and a 10.5-inch iPad. The overlap yeah. there almost feels like 100% to me. I don't understand the value proposition uh, of having two sizes closer together. It almost makes more sense in my mind, to keep it at 9.7 just so there's a bigger gap between those two iPads. Yeah, exactly. Um, So I'm not sure where the 10.2 came from, except maybe playing around with sizes in in, in Johnny's design lab and like, oh man, 10.2 feels really good and we need to to ditch (laughs) 9.7? I don't know. (laughs) Yeah, it's really weird. It's just come out of left field. Yeah. Uh, especially because this is a cheap iPad, you'd almost expect them to be reusing parts and, and to forego the the form factor they already have, you know, like machining set up for to create a new one is, is, is very odd in my mind. Uh, if, if I had to, to, to put a, a firm guess down on it, though, I would say that 10.2 is the smallest they can go and still have a full-sized uh, keyboard attached. And they, they, okay, uh, yep. Yeah, good point. So now they have a smart connector. They have to have make it just slightly bigger so the keyboard's more comfortable. So what are the selling points of the iPad Air now? It's basically a laminated screen and a newer chip. Right. Yeah, and then it's just slightly bigger. And, and yeah, 0.3 of an inch bigger. <laughs> the iPad Air always felt weird to me since they announced it. The fact that they would bring back the Air name and they'd put it in an iPad Pro chassis, but take away some of the Pro features, like the four speakers. Uh, all of it felt weird to me, and it still feels weird that it exists. I think they need to merge iPad and iPad Air and either make the iPad slightly better or the Air slightly worse and drop one. I don't know, though. Yeah, it's a bit weird. Maybe that iPad Air is the past bin iPad. Yeah, well, in the same, in the same 
same way the iPad is kind of a new chassis, the iPad Air had to be as well. Uh, the size is the same, so they can reuse a lot of the same parts, but they did have to, to change at least some of the machining for the chassis, uh, since they don't need all the speaker grills anymore at, at bare minimum. Right, so that would just be doing less to the chassis that they were making for the old 10.5-inch Pro. Right. Right. So. Yeah, interesting. Well, it's a great price. I can see this iPad being very popular. Mm-hmm. Especially in maybe an education market. Mm, yeah, for sure. Uh, Apple Watch Series 5. For me, this is like the highlight of the event. Uh, and in particular, the always-on display. I thought if they were going to do it, we would have uh, had it on the Series 4 last year. And when it didn't come, I kind of just threw my hands up and thought, oh, I guess they're not interested in doing that. But uh, <laughs> but here we go. They've, uh, they've, they've tweaked the display. Apparently, the, the actual display tech is pretty much identical between Series 4 and 5, but the display controller on the 5... Uh, is is what enables this like super low power using uh, always on display uh, down to like a one hertz refresh rate, which is it's very slow, of course, as we know. A one hertz to, makes perfect uh, sense for a watch, though. Yeah, it does. I mean, all it does is tick, right? That's right, right. Th- these things still still tick, right? <laughs> <laughs> little cogs inside spinning. <laughs> There's definitely some faces that have second hands moving. So that's the slowest refresh rate you could afford. Uh, when it's in the low power mode, the second hands are removed. They're, they're not there anymore. Oh, well, then never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think about always on display? Is it uh, a selling point for you? It's not at all for me. Um, oh, wow. I have very rarely, if if ever, in recent memory, been in a position where I felt inconvenience just to raise my wrist to look at the watch. Um. I know there's a lot of people who, who care more about it, and Apple had a lot of great examples, uh, whether you're working out or... or <laughs> maybe, maybe the best example for me is if you're in a social setting and you want to glance at your watch without making an obvious gesture of bringing your watch up to your face. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, I definitely still get that, especially around uh, older people like my parents. If, if I get like a notification on my watch, uh, like the camera went off on my house or something, and I raise my watch to look at what the notification is, immediately like uh, my dad will be like, do you have somewhere you need to be? <laughs> <laughs> Even after all these years. Yeah. It's still it's kind of seen as maybe a rude gesture. <laughs> yeah. It definitely has a bit of stigma attached to it still. Right. So I could I could see that being helpful in that case. Uh, but it's not something I've ever missed, but I know a lot of people have. So I'm sure there's, this is a very exciting update for some people. I think there are a lot of people that weren't buying the watch for this reason. Uh, I know for me, it, like the raise to just the raise to look at the to raise to wake wasn't, it was probably like 95% reliable, but that the times that it didn't come on and you had to do it twice, it was just infuriating. Oh yeah. Um, carrying kids around, of course, um, carrying shopping, uh, anything where both hands are busy and you also can't raise it because you're just you're doing something. You're normally carrying something, I found. Um, and you just need to glance at the time. It's going to be perfect for that. I have been using an always-on display on my Apple Watch for the last week or so. Uh, <laughs> how's that? Uh, this latest watchOS beta will not shut the screen off. <laughs> How's your battery life doing? Uh, surprisingly, not so bad. Uh, my watch is definitely dead at the end of the day. Um, mm-hmm. I'd say about 50% of the time it's dead by the time I go to bed. Um, but it's surprising that it makes it through the whole day, even with full like full brightness and like my notifications are pulled up and won't go away. And mm-hmm. um, the full animations and everything else running on the watch face that otherwise won't be. Uh, so I definitely think the series five can handle it. Um, but it's, it's been a little annoying to me, especially because I'll pull my watch up and it's like the full brightness of the the watch. It blinds me. Right. That's a small concern I have. What about, um, uh, at night? So for the series five, uh, at night when you're like in bed in a pitch black room, mm-hmm. is your 
slightly dim watch face going to be like, lighting up the bedroom at night. Uh, do you wear your watch or would you wear your watch when you slept? Um, yeah, I probably would. There are a lot of mm. sort of sleep tracking apps that rely on you wearing a watch while you right. sleep and then, you know, just chuck it on the charger when you wake up for 15 minutes. So I did see there's an option. Uh, first of all, you can put it in theater mode, which will apparently make it behave like it used to now where the screen will shut okay. completely off. Um, you also have the option just to turn off always on display for increased battery life. Uh, so you could do that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, okay, so theater mode sounds like the silver bullet for that problem. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, wearing it at night's not something I've ever worried about, but yeah, I suppose for some people that could be annoying. Uh, gone was any mention of the heavily rumored sleep tracking features coming to the watch. There's nothing mentioned uh, yeah, you'd about almost, that. You'd almost think this would be the perfect time to unveil something like that when they have this significantly better battery life that they can have an always on display, if they had it switch automatically from always on to just like shutting the display off at night and then leveraged its longer battery life to do sleep tracking stuff, I think that would be a perfect balance. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of rumored things for this event that did not get announced. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it was a very disappointing keynote in that respect. And of course, the the rumor people are saying that they were all pulled last minute. Not that the rumors were wrong, but uh, right, I guess we'll, the, fu- the future will answer those questions. Yeah, there's definitely some things that that were beyond question coming um, at this point, or at least Apple was all in on it until the very last second with even some of the latest, like the Golden Master of iOS 13, having references to stuff that doesn't exist yet. So. Mm, yeah. Oh, we can get to that later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, just still on the watch, uh, a few other um, little additions, the compass and uh, elevation. Um, the compass looks pretty neat. Yeah, mm-hmm. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised that it didn't have one before. I would have assumed that the GPS could kind of do that job, but uh, it seems the compass can do it better. Right. Yeah, I've never used the map on my watch uh, more than just to try it out like when I got my first one. Uh, so it surprised me that it didn't already have this functionality, but uh, I think this will be very valuable, especially if for someone who maybe navigates only with the watch and leaves their phone at home. Uh, I could see where that'd be extremely useful. I've tried the whole navigate just with the watch with no phone. It uh-huh. destroys the battery life. It does not last <laughs> very long. <laughs> Yeah, just like that and trying to make a phone call. Always for right. watch for me. <laughs> yep. Yeah, any anything anytime it's trying to use a lot of LTE. Um right. so a new a few new cases, titanium and ceramic. So ceramic is kind of a blast from the past. Although a lot of people liked that when it was on the series 3, pretty was it? Yeah. Yeah, series 3. Uh and titanium which is brand new. Yeah, uh, c- ceramic is cool. It's not thirteen hundred dollars cool like like Apple wants for it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, titanium looks really nice, and I would like to try it out if I didn't have that my band issue. Uh, surprisingly, the titanium is is more expensive than than stainless steel. Um, I say surprisingly; it makes sense that Apple would charge more for a new finish, but. If you look at the raw material cost of stainless steel versus titanium, the titanium one should have been cheaper. Mm, right. So. Maybe they had to do some sort of special process to the titanium because right. titanium has a bit of a reputation for tarnishing. Yeah, it's very possible. So, But either way, it's a, it's a new finish. It could get a lot of people excited about buying into the new watch. So, And we've already talked about the studio, which is the... Basically, mix and match whatever you want. There's no more like set combinations. This goes with that. It's kind yeah, of a, it's a free for all now, isn't it? <laughs> this makes perfect sense to me, and I was actually surprised that Apple hasn't done something like this sooner. Uh, especially with even when the the first Apple Watch was announced, did you go into an Apple store a few months ahead of launch to try them on and and try the different bands? I am not sure. I tried on bands. I, I certainly would have gone in to have a look at things ah yeah so we'll just My memory's the, fuzzy 
the uh, the experience of the whole thing where it's like, here's the watch and which bands do you want to try on? It's like, well, I want to try, you know, this watch with like the Milanese loop. Uh, like, okay, but you, can, you can't buy it in that configuration. You're going to have to <laughs> pay for it separately. <laughs> um, so it makes a lot of sense to me that they're doing this now. And it seems to go along with it. They they lowered the price of some of their bands. Uh, the leather loop and the Milanese loop are both down uh, $50 now to 100 each. Um, U.S., I'm not sure what that looks like internationally, but it's nice to see they're slowly lowering the prices on some of these bands. Uh, a few other small bits. Is it's got the same battery life, 18 hours, they say. All day, 18 hours. Mm-hmm. They don't say that for the iPhones, do they? All day, 18 hours. They said just all day. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and storage doubled to 32 gigabytes. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense now that we have uh, apps that are entirely on the watch. Right. So. And so you asked me earlier what would compel me to buy a new Apple Watch. Right. Um, and I'm still, I think, holding out for a more standalone watch. I think if, uh, as as a not, uh, someone who doesn't own an iPhone at the moment, I mean, mm-hmm. to get a watch would be quite an investment because I'd have to buy both of them. If I could either set it up with the iPad or just set it up standalone... I think I would jump on that in a heartbeat. Yeah, that'd be a great way for you to get back into getting your, your text messages and other uh, notifications. Right. Uh, yeah, this was a, a hard sell for me this year. Uh, <laughs> sure, sure. You I already bought it. Keep that I in already, mind. I already bought it. <laughs> but <laughs> I had to think about it, um, which uh, I I spent a good portion of the day deliberating, which... Uh, I don't know. I was I was kind of excited that I could order the watch immediately after the keynote. That was a neat change. At the mm-hmm. same time, it didn't give me any time to think about whether or not I really wanted it before. Because I had <laughs> to get it day problems. one. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm, ex- I'm excited to get the new finish. I think that's what sold me the most. It's just I could go back to stainless steel and not anything that Series 5 offered. Um, so that, that was it. That was the selling point. Just the... Um that that's what pushed me over the edge uh, was that I really wanted to go back to stainless steel so I could wear. I paid five hundred dollars for a link bracelet that I haven't been able to wear for the last year. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm I'm excited to to be able to do that again. Um, and when it all boiled down to it, I think what I said to myself was that uh, I've been excited about buying this watch for the last two months. I'm not going to let Apple ruin it for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so and i get what is it like uh 40 bucks cash back or something with my apple card or maybe even more really 40 bucks let me see let me have siri do some math but, for me isn't that a three percent cash back what's three percent of 800 i can't do math it's 24 24 never mind 24 dollars back the what the watch was 800 dollars yeah, for the stainless steel one. Oh, it's not, yeah, sorry. Yep. So, and I'll get more back on iPhones. <laughs> All right, that's the the next topic. On to the uh, the ne- Apple's next announcement. They announced uh, a couple of new cameras. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and that they've actually attached them to uh, some iPhones. Yeah, that's the real innovation. <laughs> this year that's, that's it yep basically well we have an iphone 11 which is the first cab off the rank and then uh the iphone 11 pro uh and just uh first off i'm i'm really happy with well almost really happy with apple's naming scheme this year i don't like iphone 11 pro max very much uh, but i i do like that they've kind of repositioned their iphone lineup uh i know last year with the 10s 10s max and 10r it kind of felt like they're saying we have the 10s which is our new consumer phone then we have the 10r which is our cheap one for people who can't afford the the new iphone Um, yeah they had to get away from that didn't they yeah they've definitely flipped it around this year where the 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 700 hundred dollar phone is marketed as their new phone and then for those who want a little extra we have the pro model and i think that's gonna serve them really well this year yeah, with the 10R making up such a huge percentage of overall iPhone sales, they they couldn't do anything but make the cheaper one the main iPhone. 
Right. It's kind of a bit like what Samsung's done, how they have like the the, the basic phones and then like the really expensive ones with what, with 5G and that sort of thing. And even right. a crazy folding phone, even more expensive. Like <laughs> they've got the good phone at a cheap price. And then if you've got crazy money, then you can buy the crazy features as well. Although saying that, there aren't too many crazy features in the in the Pro. Um, no. Naming-wise for the Pro, I was a little bit disappointed just for the fact that it doesn't have high refresh rates. I think that kind of would have really sold the Pro name to me. Uh, without that, it's like a semi-Pro, I would say. iPhone 11 semi-Pro. Right. Yeah, I think there's a, a couple of things they could have done to easily warrant the Pro name. Uh, a high refresh rate, a high refresh rate display is an obvious one. Uh, their reverse wireless charging would have been a nice one. Uh, I think a big way they could have done it is they just put a USB C port on it, the same way the iPad Pro has USB C. I think that could have been enough to warrant the Pro name right there. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. It needed USB C because the masses could have been happy. You know, people would have had the choice then. Like, do you want to keep with Lightning or? If you know, if you're really interested in tech and you, and you want to spend the extra money, then you want to have like the current industry standard of charging, which is USB C. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's, it seems so obvious. It's kind of mildly infuriating <laughs> that it still has lightning. Yeah. It, uh, it almost, this year, surprisingly this year, uh, I was almost tempted by the iPhone 11. Uh, just because I like the the uh, the extra colors that came in, so I think in that which way, color would be yours? I kind of really liked the purple one. Mm, okay, um, just because it's it's different and new. Um, on the flip side, uh, I, I will be going with with the pro this year, but uh, I'm having a, a easy time and also a hard time picking a color for that. Uh, the the hardest decision was is really easy for me, which is do I want the green one? And I don't at all. Uh, okay. A lot of people seem to be uh, interested in that green one. Right. I it, it just doesn't... It's not attractive to me. I don't like it very much, uh, which is which is great because that means when I'm ordering my phone, not at midnight anymore, but at like 7 a.m. my time, which is really nice. Mm-hmm. Um I don't have to worry about rushing quite so much because the most in-demand color is not the one I want. But then that leaves me with the other three. I've really liked my gold iPhone this last year. Um, so I don't know if I want to stick with that or, or go back to white or black this year. Uh, are you going Pro Max? I don't I don't think so. Uh, I had the 10s Max for a while and it felt really big. And I switched to the 10s and I've been really happy with that. And especially now that the 11 Pro has the extra four hours of battery life, I don't really feel any strong, compelling reason to get the Pro Max. It is a ginormous phone, but yeah, it doesn't really have too many too many more selling points than the right. regular Pro. They could have done one thing like, uh, I don't know, made one of the cameras optically stabilized only on the Max, and that would have been enough to sell it for me. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I remember when they did that on I think it was the six and the six plus. Yeah, uh, but but just because they are identical, other than battery life, I'm completely happy going with a smaller phone this year. So actual improvements wise from the 10R to the 11, there's not a lot to it, is there? We're talking about a, a double camera system, uh, mm-hmm. but they haven't opted for regular and telly they've gone for a regular and wide mm-hmm. although the regular they call wide um it adds a night mode finally mm-hmm. um got a bit more battery life and that's basically it isn't it so as as someone who uh is is way more into photography than me what's your opinion on the new camera setups it's uh I don't know. It, it seems like they're playing a bit of catch up with, with other companies really. Oh, with this ultra yeah. wide stuff, it seems to be all the craze is to have ultra wide cameras on your phone, and they've mm-hmm. just looked at that and thought, no, I guess we need to do that as well. Um, some of the the detail shots that they showed, uh, there was like a guy sitting in a sweater, and they said this 
photo was taken in low light and then used the loop on his on like the threads that looked like really high quality so maybe it's seeing is believing um but still it's it's nothing compared to just a regular camera like it's i mean you can't do like with sensors that small i mean they're doing amazing things with sensors so small like it's you know you're measuring it in millimeters instead of centimeters like on an actual camera so they are doing an incredible job with what they've mm-hmm. got um but it's still not going to convince me to get rid of a cameras a real camera if i had this phone um right and personally i prefer like regular like the regular lens on on current iphones at the moment is already pretty wide for my taste so that's just a personal thing like i pretty much always would switch to a telly um oh, so really? that would push me to to having a pro as well because uh the 11 non pro doesn't even have the telly lens i think and maybe this is just me having a more <laughs> or a, a worse eye for photos uh I think I would be happier with the ultra wide than the telephoto camera. Okay. Um, and, and maybe it's just because of the way that I try to frame photos, but, uh, I find myself having to back up a lot, especially when I'm trying to take photos of the kids to get everything in frame. I feel like the ultra wide is going to help with that a lot. And at the mm, same time, yep. telephoto, uh, for me was always very hit or miss. Um, because depending on, the exact lighting conditions you're taking the photos in. Sometimes if you'd press two X, it wouldn't actually switch over to the telephoto camera. It would just zoom in with the regular one because it has slightly better. I don't even know what the words are. (laughs) It has a large (laughs) aperture in the regular lens compared to the telly. Yeah. So, so sometimes the iPad or the iPhone would decide that doing a two X digital zoom was going to give you a better photo, but that's never something I'd want to had do. And there was no way that it was indicating in the in the viewfinder which one it was doing. So it made me not quite trust it as much. I think you can force it to use the telly if you just hold your finger over the regular lens and forces it to switch over. Right. Yeah, that's the only way I could ever tell which one it was using is because I'd stick my finger up there and see what was <laughs> happening. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but now that it seems... And maybe maybe I don't understand the numbers fully, but between all three cameras, they seem to be pretty identical. Like it should never have to favor one over the other. No, I think the regular still has a large aperture now. I uh, think they've all like bumped up a quarter of an f-stop, but um, or maybe I'm confusing the regular and the wide. But yeah, one of them was definitely an f one point eight, and the other was an f two. I remember Phil talking about that on stage. Okay. Uh, I, I see numbers like that. Which. And it, and it means nothing to me, so I just <laughs> gloss right over them. <laughs> Typically, a lower number is better because it lets more light in. So okay. that's what you're looking for. Huh. So let's see. I'm trying to see here. The ultra wide has f2.4. The wide has f1.8. And the telephoto is f2.0. Okay, there you go. I think that's the reason they were also saying that the ultra wide is like uh, like this hyperfocal sort of range, you can fo- like everything's going to be in focus because um, a smaller aperture does mean like to the f two point four would typically mean you've got uh, more depth of field in your photos, so more stuff is going to be in focus, um, mm-hmm. which is cool. Although never really a problem I had on the the regular lenses anyway. It also looks like the ultra wide camera doesn't have optical image stabilization, and it probably doesn't really need it either because you you much less likely to notice a shake on an ultra wide framing. That's fair. It's also a five element lens instead of a six, like on the other two, but I don't even know what that means. So, uh, the night mode photos looks interesting. So they're talking about it. Um, it's basically taking photos. I mean, it always has kind of captured frames before you press the shutter. Um, just to make the live photos. Of course it has to be capturing sure. everything that's, that's that the camera's seeing. Um, but now they seem to be doing something a little bit extra and using those those captured frames to kind of in to work out which are the the best pixels and to uh, to merge them together. Of course, using the um, the bionic the neural engine to um, the machine learning to to get the best pixels into like the best sharpest 
uh, well lit photo uh, as the end result. And the end result looked very nice on screen, at least even blown up to that massive resolution. Yeah, their their demo photos all look really good. Um, I'm excited to play with it in person and see. Uh, it seems like from from early hands on videos that this is not all post processing either. That you're getting a live view of what the photo is going to look like, just like portrait mode works, uh, which is a little bit above and beyond what the Pixel phone even does, uh, because it does all the processing after you snap the photo. So I'm excited to actually see if it's as good as as they claim it is. Uh, and the last thing on the iPhone 11 is that's got a uh, a U1 chip, and it is a complete enigma at this point. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> the mystery chip. <laughs> so it's an ultra wide band radio, right? And what is it there for? Uh, man, I was I was literally uh, yelling at the television uh, when that happened. Where Phil was like, he threw up that like wall of information about the iphone and on there it says new u1 chip like you can't just say there's a new chip and not tell us what it does <laughs> <laughs> now this is certainly a case where something seems to have been thrown out of the presentation last right because uh, if you look at apple's uh press material that u1 chip is only so you can point your phone at someone and they'll show up first in your airdrop list <laughs> <laughs> which is a lot of development time on new silicon just to reorder your hairdrop list. Mm. Yep. Certainly got the feeling that it's going to have something else to do with locating <laughs> <laughs> maybe a, a tile type device, maybe uh, even some augmented reality. Who knows? I think they're going to have to, well, I say have to, uh, but they could pull an air power on us. A preemptive air power without even announce it, but then also it never happens. Um, yeah, that, that was my one of my thoughts. Is they are a little bit apprehensive about announcing something if it's not like a lot closer to ready than than it might appear because they yeah they don't want to go through another air power. Right. Yeah. It's it's uh, kind of walking a tightrope right now where if they announce too early. They're kind of maximizing risk of something going catastrophically wrong and having to cancel again. Uh, on the flip side, the longer they wait, the more we're learning just from reading into their software and the mm-hmm. the less exciting this announcement's actually going to be. Well, crossing fingers for October, hey? Yeah, it seems... Uh, I don't want to say it seems inevitable because it almost seemed inevitable for this keynote as well, but uh, yeah, I guess fingers crossed. Um, on the pro cameras... Or on the pro phone in general, but the, the pro cameras, they certainly trigger a slight sense of trypophobia in me. That, really? Uh, that fear of clusters or like holes. Yeah. Right. It uh, it looks disgusting to me, basically. <laughs> I do not like and en- I do not enjoy looking at it. it uh, yeah. So, I, I guess you don't have that uh, that trypophobia. Uh, um, no, that's the that, that's totally real thing that I have as well. Uh, maybe it's just oh, yeah? smaller holes for me. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not a fan of how it looks, but it definitely doesn't trigger trypophobia. Um, okay, but I'm waiting until I have it in my hands to reserve, reserving judgment until then. All right. I'm sure I'd get used to it if I if I had it in my hands for a while, but ugh, I can't even. I can't even think about even holding it in my hand at the moment. <laughs> it's that bad, huh? It's that bad. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I always thought the. Uh, the pill shape was kind of a the way of getting past that on previous phones. Like the two cameras are just kind of the one unit almost, and they mm-hmm. look like that from the outside. I'm sure if it was two separate holes, it it would um, also been a little bit tripo for me. Uh, but yeah, the three. Ugh. <laughs> what do you think about the fact that we have camera bumps on top of camera bumps now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just need all that extra space. I don't, how much bigger is it than previous camera bumps? Uh, I'm not sure what the exact dimensions are, but it seems like these new phones are uh, at least like a couple tenths of a millimeter bigger in every dimension. Mm, okay. Yeah, it doesn't look too bad the, the way they've done it with uh, like contrasting finishes on the bump compared mm-hmm. to the actual phone. Um, yeah, that part of it I think looks pretty neat. Yeah. 
uh, I th- I'm leaning towards the space gray color right now. I think that's what looks best in terms of the camera bump because then it's just a glossy black, which I think is better than color. So yeah, yep, yeah, I think that'll look pretty good. But let me let me run this name by you and uh, get your opinion on it iPhone 11 Pro Max with Super Retina Display XDR. <laughs> I think they're really doing an injustice to the actual um, Pro Display XDR by by giving the same like little um, tagline to an iPhone display, which doesn't even do like 120. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt when they said it. Like, do you really want to degrade the the in the um the significance of the letters xdr by just you know sticking it on a phone with a slightly brighter display and a slightly better contrast ratio than previous phones yeah it's like they really just needed another reason to justify calling it a pro so they gave it a fancy right. name for the display yeah we turned the brightness slider up to 11 on this phone so this is <laughs> that's a selling point <laughs> how now, are we going to sell that imagine next year they they do finally get around to putting pro motion on the display and we have the the super retina pro motion display xdr <laughs> <laughs> yeah it sounds ridiculous doesn't it they've just they've gone overboard with their naming pro max and and super retina and they're just uh, overselling themselves and uh it, it it really makes it seem like they're overcompensating they've turned into the companies that we used to make fun of back when it was just iPhone 4, 4S, 5, blah, blah, blah. And then all these other companies have these ridiculous long names. Yeah, like the Samsung Galaxy Note Max or whatever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I think HTC might have had something ridiculous as well. Yeah. Windows Phone, 7 Series Phone, and then the actual name of the phone. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's ridiculous. I would have been much happier if they would have dropped max and and maybe even the 11 and we just had iphone and iphone pro in two sizes i think that could yeah. have served them well pro plus even doesn't sound too bad especially if it's just a plus sign instead of the word plus right i think i think they have to do that though they'd have to kind of eat their words from last year where they said plus is whatever 5.5 inch and max is 6.5 and ah, oh, they don't care about history <laughs> And, uh, of course, they did actually end up dropping 3D Touch this year, as we pretty much all mm-hmm. but confirmed. Uh, yep. I don't know how I feel about that yet. I guess I'll have to get used to it. Uh, but even using, using iOS 13 on my on my 10s, I still use 3D Touch quite a bit. So. Yeah, and, I mean, it's still there in as haptic touch, kind of. Right, no, it's yeah. cool. The thing I'm going to miss most... And my number one use case of 3D Touch is always just moving the cursor. The fact that I'm going to have to consciously put my finger on the space bar now to do that is going to take a little bit of getting mm-hmm. used to. Uh, yep. But even worse is the fact that I can't press a little harder to select text now. Um, I'm right. either going to have to tap with a second finger or press and hold. And, and that's going to be definitely a step in the opposite direction in terms of convenience. Yeah. They must have seen metrics about how few people were using this the 3d touch right and the they had, had to to weigh up uh how many people are using it versus consistency ag- across like all their product lines um yeah no i think they're I think it was completely just, justified it's just disappointing yeah yeah on the plus side there's now an 18 watt usb c charger in the box yeah we live in a crazy new world <laughs> It's going to stay in the box for me since I have wireless chargers everywhere. Uh, mm-hmm. So maybe a little too little too late on their end. But uh, I loved when uh, Phil announced it on stage and he paused for applause and, and no one clapped. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that we can actually give the word, uh, the title finally to. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no one's, no one's going to applaud you doing the bare minimum, Phil. And... Good thing that it is a USB-C charger, so, you know, people with new MacBooks can also just charge off their MacBook now as well. You don't, you know, it's getting rid of at least one annoyance, having USB-A some places and C in other places. 
Right. And for that reason, I feel like they should have just done that with the iPhone 11 as well. Mm. Yep. But I think, uh, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to see USB-C now. I'm starting to feel like it's more likely than ever. Um, or if Apple's still going to go all in on just a completely portless device. I'd be so surprised if they ever have a completely portless device. Really? So surprised, yeah. So, I just, I... I I, I agree with you more now than I would have a year ago uh, when they flopped on, on air power, and it seems like maybe even failed on this reverse wireless charging in their phones. Maybe they're finding out wireless charging isn't quite as easy as they thought it was going to be. Mm-hmm, yep. So... Yeah, I think they could definitely go in all in on USB C next year. Yeah, so the the current cycle, um, I think this is why people might have been disappointed. Like it's very clearly not like a tick tock cycle anymore. It's like a tick tick tock cycle. Um, yeah. As evidence, like the iPhone six, six S, and then seven were all basically the same design before they went to the ten, and now we've had ten, ten S, and eleven. All basically mm-hmm. the same design, another three. So that does seem to be the cycle now, and maybe it, it's I don't know, just where they've got to now is that it's a lot harder to make any sort of fundamental change to the phone. Either I don't know because there's there's less potential there that they used up a lot of the potential of of where a phone can bo- can go from the original iPhone or is it because it's just so much harder to 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 manufacture phones in such a high volume? I'm not sure which of those it would be. Probably a combination of both. Um, but those those massive changes are coming around less and less often. I am surprised that Apple hasn't made any steps towards shrinking the notch at all. That seems like the obvious next step for them in terms of iterating their phone design. Uh, and it was one thing a couple years ago when the 10 was basically the highest screen to body ratio of any phone on the market. Uh, but now, you know, every, every single phone manufacturer, including mid range phones have almost edge to edge displays and the notch is starting to look a little long in the tooth. Uh, and even if they were just to reduce the size a little bit and not go to a cutout or anything else, I think that could have, could have helped quite a bit with at least making the phone feel a little more fresh. Uh, I wonder if they, I bet they did have the potential, the capability to reduce the size of the notch this year, but just opted to to keep it the same, either as like a, a uniformity thing or a branding thing, or um, just to save the resources and to put it into whatever is coming next year. Man, yeah, next year better be <laughs> extremely impressive. Uh, yeah, it better be. I, I feel like I've been saying this a lot in the last few years, uh, but this year especially, I think was probably the most underwhelming iphone keynote i've ever seen yeah i know i i think our expectations are always pretty high and there have been a lot of years that just were letdowns um i don't know maybe like the the seven year i remember that being certainly a letdown because that was the first time we didn't just have like a complete new design in the like the third year following a Oh, the yeah. second year following a, a design. That's fair. Yeah, they didn't redesign it. They took the headphone jack away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, the dual rear camera was kind of a saving grace in that, and definitely AirPods at the same time. Mm. Uh, but no, I totally agree that uh, 7 is probably a good example. I think even more recently, uh, the 10s felt underwhelming as a follow-up to the 10. Yeah, but that was on the like the off cycle year, so that was always going to be an update. I, sure, at least me, I expected it just to be a minor update. Whereas this year, I was kind of expecting something a bit more. Yeah, well, I have my fingers crossed for more of a, a squared off iPad Pro design next year for the iPhone. <laughs> That's actually what I was picturing as I was listening to it with my eyes closed and Phil said all new design and those oh, images no. popped up in my head. And, <laughs> uh, that was a, um, a multiplying factor on my disappointment later in the day. <laughs> <laughs> and did he say that in 
in reference specifically to the iPhone 11? Or was that the iPhone 11 Pro? He said all new design. Oh, you know, I can't remember. I was trying to remember just before the show, but um, uh, I'm not sure. Right. Because yeah, I, I seem, I feel like I remember him saying it in reference to the Pro, which would be extra weird because the Pro and the 11 are almost identical in design. And to say the 11 mm-hmm. isn't a redesign, but the Pro is, is, is even more nonsensical. <laughs> yep. Although they do have industry-leading uh, tough glass. Oh, man. They said that so many times. Did you go back and, and did you watch the whole keynote over again when you actually went to see it? Uh, no, not the keynote, but I watched plenty of, um, you know, summary videos, um, you know, mm. things The Verge puts out, basically. I think maybe one of the more amusing parts for me was when they were comparing the speed of the A13 to A12 and, and the Snapdragons and Exynos and equivalents on the market. <laughs> they showed just gray lines with, with no graphs or indicators. It's just like, if the A12 is this line, then the A13 is this blue line that's slightly longer. <laughs> <laughs> is that the uh, the Bezos um, graph or chart, as they call it? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Have you heard of that? I have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, just completely... I don't, I don't even know how to describe it, but but no point of reference other than it's better than these. <laughs> nice. So that, and I felt like they said the word chip a lot that year. Did you catch on to that if you were just listening to it? No, I didn't notice that. I don't know if, if this has always been their branding, uh, but they never said anything like uh, A12 processor, A13 processor. It was always... Our chips are better than their chips. And uh, it felt weird to me. Hmm. Maybe it was the influence of buying like that uh, 4G um, or 5G arm of um, of Intel. Maybe <laughs> they've got more chip people floating around the office now. Maybe. <laughs> uh, there's one other thing we didn't mention about the Pro is that it's got more battery life, which is four hours on the 11 Pro and... Um, five hours on the Pro Max. <laughs> <laughs> that's Still getting tongue tied. That's a very respectable improvements in battery life. Um, they really needed to, especially when the 10 hours getting like insane battery life compared to the 10s. Right, and I want this couldn't be a result of taking 3D Touch out. They couldn't have given them that much more space. But no, no, something the, to do with the display in the um, A13. Yeah, the A13 definitely seems to be more of a focus on uh, efficiency over performance this year. And I think that might be why they didn't give exact numbers when they're talking about performance. And I think that's very justified as well. I mean, they talked about like a new seven nanometer process. Um, well, just briefly, they didn't really talk about it. Um, but yeah. That probably has something to do with uh, the battery life savings. Um, I mean, the A12 just blew everything out of the water there are no complaints about the speed of that thing so perfectly yeah, within reason to to focus on a uh, an energy um, improvement rather than performance yeah uh, that combined with the fact that these phones are a few tenths of a millimeter bigger in every dimension i wonder if they're able to squeeze a bigger battery in because of that hmm yeah have a look at the battery specs yeah. Is that something that Apple publishes, or are we going to have to wait till someone takes this phone apart to see what the actual battery sizes are? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they just give it in hours of usage. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, overall, pretty pretty underwhelming, but that's not going to prevent me from, from ordering the phone the moment I'm able to. <laughs> yeah. I think the iPhone's just going to, like, trudge along another year. People are going to update. People are going to get the new one. People are going to get the cheapest one they can, most likely. People get it on contracts. People get it on payment plans. Um, right. I don't. This certainly doesn't seem to suggest any, like, I don't know, any problems with with iPhone. It's just yeah. another iterative update, which people are going to buy, basically. And it'll <laughs> keep doing what it's been doing for a long time, which is grow, but not in leaps and bounds probably yeah i'm really excited about more of what the potential of this phone is um i'm definitely buying an iphone 11 pro uh with the expectation that this 
U1 chip is going to be leveraged in some really impressive way uh, at some point within the lifetime of this phone. Right, yeah. So, right. Uh, Anything else from the event? Uh, no, I think that's it. All right, well, I'm James VDM on Reddit and on Twitter. And I'm Jelly Woot on Reddit and Twitter. And you know what? I forgot to mention, too. Uh, mm-hmm. I think some, some congratulations are in order for you. Yeah, so um, Yasmin's expecting another baby. Yeah. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's really exciting. How far along is she? Uh, she's just out of the first trimester now, so... Um, uh, so okay. the baby's due in March. We'll find out the gender in about uh, six weeks, hopefully. That's the part I'm looking forward to most. Oh yeah, you got. And uh, then yeah, is that what you're hoping for? You know, I don't really mind. I think because I've got a boy at the moment, another boy would be like a play buddy, but it'd also be cool just to have a girl to, right. uh, to have one of each. You know, got to catch them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. I'm afraid, uh, apprehensive about how little free time I'm going to have once there are two of them. That's <laughs> my biggest worry. I, I think I think it's. I mean, maybe I'm not one to talk, but but coming from someone with four kids, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it gets much worse with an extra one from one to two. Do you mean? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think I think the jump from one to two is the worst, and after that, it gets easier. Um, mm, yeah. But in my mind, it's not that much more work. And the hardest part has nothing to do with the number of kids and more of the age. Uh, mm, yeah, okay. Because uh, it's not fun to go back to that time period where they're, they're so little, they can't, they can't get around or really do anything, and you really have to, to carry them, or it just it makes getting out and doing stuff a lot harder but once they grow up a little yeah. bit the number doesn't really make that much of a difference yeah we, we try to space them like far enough apart that's not insane but not too far apart that we have to go through that whole period like all over again completely right i think they're yeah you know two and a half and zero is going to be i don't yeah. know a reasonable gap in my mind yeah that's about the spacing between all of mine is two to two and a half years yep nice so the, it's just frustrating because that's about the point you're just getting out of diapers and you got to go right back into diapers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Joy.